Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> I would like to personally thank whoever passed the call to our house. I'm praying for you. <laughs> um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to 1 John, chapter 4. <coughs> Next week, we're going to start a mini-series. Um, I want to kind of introduce the topic uh, this week, what we're going to be dealing with over the next couple of weeks. We're going to be talking about our identity. Okay? You hear that phrase a lot, you know, you need to know your identity, you need to know who you are. Uh, I think it's more important that we know whose we are. Okay? But this week, um, I want to share with you something that God revealed to me, and he actually revealed it to me through my wife. Uh, every morning, Christy gets up without fail, and she spends time in prayer, and then she writes <coughs> notes of encouragement to people. And um, I get copied on all her notes, so I get all the encouragement. Um, <coughs> and this morning, she made a point that really kind of touched me because I, I, it was something that I'd been looking at over the course of the week, but I'd never looked at in this particular way. Okay, so in, in 1 John, I'm going to read to you a passage of Scripture, but there's two verses I really want us to focus on. So I'm going to start um, in verse 7. Now, does everybody know who wrote the book of 1 John? John. John. Which John? The first John. The first John. Not the second or the third. And definitely not the gospel. Thank you for confusing the issue. No. This is John, the beloved disciple. Okay? This is the brother of James. This is the, also the author of Revelation. Okay? Um... He was the only apostle that was not martyred, although it wasn't for a lack of trying. They did try to kill him, he just, God wouldn't let him die. He wasn't ready for him to die. So John is writing this letter, and in verse 7, he picks up and he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God... God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. That's a whole lot of love. Okay. Um, I think where Paul had incredible insight into the mind of God. John had incredible insight into the heart of God. Okay? And the two things that I want us to key in on, he's talking about love and, and how it works and, and all that, that comes out of this. Okay? Jesus said, No greater love has any man than that he lay down his life for his friend. Okay? So, John is writing this. John who reclined against the Lord, who leaned up against him, 
Okay? He says, Let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Okay, now, we, we've talked multiple times about the, the different Greek words for love. Okay? And this is agapeo. This is the unconditional love that is based on the giver, not on the receiver. Okay? It's unqualified. It's not earned. It's just given. Okay? So this isn't, you know, I love my dog. I love my SpaghettiOs. I love my car. I love my country. And it may not even be, I love my wife or my children. This is the kind of love that put Jesus up on the cross for us. Okay, so when he says love one another, he's talking about that kind of love, the sacrificial love. Okay? And then he goes on and he says, uh, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. That's the phrase I want us to key in there. God is love. Okay? He repeats the same phrase all the way down in verse 16. He says, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. Okay? Um, we are called to something greater than ourselves. Okay? And this, this thing that is greater than ourselves can only be birthed of God and it can only be birthed in us if God abides in us, if the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Okay? There's a willingness to continue sacrificing yourself for others, putting yourself out, because it's not based on whether or not they're earning it. They're not meriting it. It's based on the spirit that lives inside of you that enables you to love in the first place. Okay? So, God is love. Now, we hear that phrase, and, and to be honest with you, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. When I hear that phrase, I think of BW bugs with flowers painted on them. <laughs> okay? You know, peace and love, dude. You know? That's, that's the whole thing. And it, I, Not only was it the 60s and 70s, but it was in Southern California. Okay? So there was a lot of peace and love. All right? That's not what this is talking about. But kind of it is. Okay? Because the idea is it's unqualified. Okay, um, so if God is love, and this is the part that, that really struck me this morning, okay, Christy sent a text out this morning, and she gave me unique insight to a passage of script that I, I've read over and over and over again, and I have never looked at in this light. So if you would put the first slide up for me, Josh. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, go over there with me if you would. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And it's up there. The, the section that I want to read is up there. Uh, this is verse 4 through 6. Okay. And this is Paul writing to the Corinthians. And he's trying to explain what this kind of love is. Alright. This is something that is not because it's earned. It's not based on somebody stirring up an emotion in you, it's based on a decision. Okay? And so Paul is writing, he says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, <coughs> believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And then the next verse says, love never fails. Now, how many of you are familiar with that passage of Scripture? Put your hands up. Put, come on, put them up. I mean, it's pretty common. I mean, if you've been in church for any length of time, you're going to hear about this, okay? This is not something we aspire to. 
You understand that? This is not a lofty goal that we are seeking to achieve. This is something that is birthed within us because God's Spirit lives in us. Okay? And the more we relinquish control of our life and let God rule and reign, the more this will happen. <coughs> Excuse me. So, what Christy did this morning is she rewrote scripture. <gasps> she did what? She rewrote scripture. But she rewrote scripture to give us a, a different perspective. I just read in 1 John that God is love. And what she did is she went through and she took out all the references to love and replaced it with God. So if you would, go ahead and put the second one up. We're going to read it again. God is patient and kind. God does not envy or boast. He is not arrogant or rude. He does not insist on his own way. He is not irritable or resentful. He does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. God bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, God never fails. Now, I have been in the church since I was six years old. That's a long time. And I have never made this association. <coughs> So, for those of you that are already a step ahead of me, walk through this with me, okay? If God is love and He is all of these things, all of these things are descriptions of Him. What an awesome God we serve. I, I get so tired of people thinking that being a Christian is boring. Boring. You know, Paul writes in Romans that all things are permissible, but not everything is beneficial. We have freedom now that we have never had before. But we do not use this freedom as a license to sin. As a matter of fact, that freedom, the freedom is actually to be able to not sin. To choose not to. And if God is all of these things, I mean, if, if he is patient and kind, would you agree with that statement? God is patient and kind? I mean, think about this. It's been 2,000 years plus since Jesus went to the cross and he's dealt with all the garbage that mankind has dished out for that 2,000 years. And he hasn't unleashed his wrath yet. Would you say that he is being patient? <coughs> I would say so. He does not envy or boast. It's not boasting if it's true, right? When God speaks about his awesome power, it's not boasting. It's truth. It's by his very word that everything that we know is held together. Just because he says so. That's it. That's the only reason. It was by his word that everything came into being. Because he said so. Now, I believe in some measure we have the creative ability with the words that we speak, but I, unfortunately I think we all too often use it in a destructive capacity. This political season should make that pretty self-evident. <clears throat> but we hear incredible songs being sung this morning. I was listening. I sat down in worship. <coughs> Yes, the pastor sat down in worship, and I, I just listened, and I was hearing beautiful anthems being raised to God. 
And it had nothing to do with people's ability to see. It had to do with people's hearts. People that were just willing to, to say those things to a God that they believed them to be absolutely true about. God is not arrogant or rude. I, uh, I have to tell you, there have been some things circulating around the internet by people that are, are professing to be Christian that I find, quite honestly, very disturbing. I hear people talking very rude, very judgmental, very arrogant, and doing it in the name of Christ. Look, truth is truth. It doesn't need to be done with arrogance. It simply is. Okay? When, when I tell you that the sun is out, I don't need to make it rude or cocky or snotty. I'm simply stating something that is. The sun is out. Okay? And, and I've been very disturbed by this increasing tendency by those who are professing Christ and even targeting a particular audience of Christians that are just snots. And they're, they're, they're speaking anger and rhetoric. And there's no joy. There's no peace. There's no, it's my way or the highway. It's, it's pride. It's all about themselves and what they believe and where they stand. And, and I'm thinking, wow. Wow. You just attracted absolutely no one to God. You have not edified God in the slightest in anything that you said. Now, don't get me wrong, because sometimes the truth is harsh. Sometimes it is very harsh. I mean, Jesus said some things to his disciples and to some of the people around him that... He said, in love, when that rich young ruler came, he said, hey, one thing you lack. Sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and come follow me. Because he knew that man was stuck. That man's God was his possessions. He knew he was trapped. And the man went away. Jesus looked after him and he felt that. He, he was hurt for this young man. He loved him. But he knew the truth. He didn't get up on a high rock and condemn the man in front of everybody about his false gods and his idolatry and everything that he'd done wrong in his life. He simply told the truth. When they brought the adulterous woman to him, by law, he should have picked up a stone and flung it at her head. When everything was done and all the Pharisees had left, all the leaders had left, he spoke truth to her. He said, go and quit sinning. When he talked to the woman at the well, he was very truthful with her. He said, yeah, you've been married five times and the man you're living with is not your husband. He spoke truth to her. But it wasn't done in arrogance. <coughs> it was not to inflate himself. It was to meet a specific need at a particular time for God's glory. Okay? So truth sometimes is harsh. But if it's not done in love, if it is not done with a genuine compassion for the person to whom you are speaking, shut up. One of my life verses, and this is direct from the translation of Glenn, <laughs> Even a fool is thought wise if he shuts up. Just keep your mouth closed. People think you know all kinds of things. But when you open your mouth, you reveal how ignorant you are. Okay? So, if God is, he's not irritable. Okay, as parents, have any of you ever struggled with irritability? <laughs> you know, because on that one Saturday where you actually have nothing planned and you get to sleep in, that's the one Saturday that your children wake up. And uh, yes, even earlier than normal, and they're hyped up and they're energetic, and they want to play Let's Punch Things. 
And you just want it. <coughs> and so you wake up in your Saturday that is going to be restful and beautiful and recovering and delightful is irritable. <laughs> Edgy. Okay? We all struggle with that. All right? Even the kids, because when mom and dad finally get up, they make the kids stop. And the day that the kid had planned that was going to be fun and full of breaking things <laughs> is no more. Okay? So we all struggle with this. Okay? But God doesn't. God doesn't get irritable. Have you ever wondered about that? Have you ever thought about that idea? God doesn't get irritable? Yes. Talk about long suffering. Wow. I, I have um, pet peeves. I've got a zoo of pet peeves. Okay? I, I really, I struggle. I get an itch in the middle of my belly when I hear mouth noises. <laughs> I want to lay hands on people. <laughs> God does not struggle with that. God doesn't have those. Okay? He's not resentful. Now, don't get me wrong. God has a right to what is His. He has a right to be worshipped. And He detests when we worship and bow down to other things. And we all do. We all have idols in our lives. Things that distract us from God. Things that we bow down to. Oh, I don't bow down to anything. Yes, you do. We all do. The scary thing is, the thing that always concerns me is the ones I don't see. The ones I do see, I can take steps. I can cut certain things out of my life. But the ones we don't see, that's what scares me. What am I bowing down to that I don't even realize I'm bowing down to? <coughs> he does not rejoice at wrongdoing. He doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Have you ever been in a situation where you know somebody is doing something wrong, <coughs> and there is an opportunity for you to correct that in love, to, to bring it to their attention, and you don't say anything? Do you know that's error? That's sin? And, and we're so concerned, oh, we don't want to step on toes. We don't want to make a, a problem. We don't, Galatians tells us that if, if you turn someone from the sin, you, you may have saved them. You're more concerned about not hurt feelings and, and you're letting them dwell in sin. Is that what love is? Is that not rejoicing at what you're doing, but rejoicing in the truth? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you to go nitpick people's lives. Okay? Don't, don't go out and look for all the little things that people do that you don't like. I'm talking about sin issues. Okay? If you see a brother or sister stuck in a sin, an error, you got to talk to them. you got to talk to them. Look, coming to me is the second step. Going to them is the first step. Go to them and talk to them. Talk to them in love. Well, I'm not good at confrontation. It doesn't have to be confrontation. It's, it's called love. Go and tell them, hey, you know, I, I just, I see that you're struggling with this. Is there, you know, a way I can help you? Can I pray with you? You don't have to go out and say, hey, what's wrong with you? Don't you know that's sin? No, uh, anybody here appreciate when someone comes at them like that? 
Anyone? Put your hand up so I know. Okay, because I have not met anyone yet that likes that. Okay, even when people come to you in love and they come speaking out of love and you know they are concerned for you, that's still tender. That's a tender area. But man, when they come thumping on it, nobody likes that. Okay, so don't worry. You don't have to do that. Just come to the club. And then, if there's a problem, come talk to me. And we'll go together in love. Okay? Because what's the idea here? Is the idea to get them to act like you? No, the idea is to get the sin out of the way so that they can enjoy a right relationship with God. Okay? So, he doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. God bears all things. And I tell you what, I've given him a lot to bear. And so have you. I look back at some of the things that I have done throughout my life, and I just go, oh, wow. God bears those things. You know, and, and, and you want to see the literal expression of him bearing those things? It's the cross. Okay? That's, that's, that's what we're talking about here. All of that, all of my mistakes, all of my sin, intentional or unintentional, is dealt with at the cross. Okay? Now, God believes all things. Well, that's, that's kind of, if God believes, well, yeah, he is. I mean, it's, it's not a struggle for him. He doesn't have to have faith because he knows what's true. I would love to be at that point, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. To just know. To just know. Hope's all things. He is where our hope is. You know? He endures all things. Again, I, I just picture the, the passion as they were, were beating him and scourging him. <clears throat> mocking him. They beat him to a point where he was no longer recognizable as a human. I've seen some people that have been pretty beat up, but you could always recognize that they were human. He endures all things. Why does he endure all things? Is it for his sake? No, it's for our sake. Okay? So, the last point part that, that is not up there. God never fails. Now I know a lot of us can look at our lives and go, well, who did God fail there? He didn't fail. Our understanding of success was wrong. Okay? Our understanding of success was wrong. Uh, Thaddeus and I watched Do You Believe? Um, no, I'm sorry, no. Uh, God's Not Dead. Um, this week. We actually watched both, but I, I still there's that one line as a man's dying in the street and the pastor is talking to him and he says, you know, um, God says no to a lot of things. And the pastor tells him, God gives us the answer we would want if we knew what he knew. <clears throat> See, we're stuck with our limited knowledge. And so we think we know what we want. But God, who sees all things and knows all things, goes, yeah, that's not going to be good for you. You might think it's going to be good for you, but it's not. <coughs> okay? Uh, I'm going to confess a story. My dad <laughs> loved malted milk. And it, my mom used to buy the thing of chocolate malt. And he would put it in his milk and he'd drink it and... We were not supposed to have it without permission. I got home from school one day and mom wasn't home. And so I went to the cupboard and, oh, it's in a new can. And so I pull it out and I open it up and I pour my milk and I scoop out the chocolate and I'm putting it in and it's not really mixing very well. It's not mixing hardly at all. I'm shaking and shaking and then I hear my mom pull out. Uh-oh. Put the lid on the can, put the can, start chugging. It was baking something. <laughs> it was horrible. It was awful. 
It was not malt. It was baking cocoa. And how am I going to confess that to my mother? It was horrible. God never fails us, folks. Okay? And, and I, want, I have one more passage that I want to read, and then we're going to do something a little bit different. See, the, the first thing that it says there is God is patient and kind. And you notice I didn't touch kind. Um, if you would, flip with me to um, Romans chapter 2. verse 1 through 5 and I'm, I'm going to explain it in just a second because it doesn't really make sense but I have to go back and explain some things so Paul is writing to the, the Romans and he says therefore you have no excuse O man every one of you who judges for in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself because you the judge practice the very same things we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impatient, impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Now, all of that... Right in the center there, the core of this is the nugget, is what I want to get to. Okay? Verse 4, it says, Do you suppose, O oh man, oh, I'm sorry, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Now, let's look back up there at love. <coughs> and it says, Love is kind, God is kind. He bears all things. He endures all things. So he's, he's um, patient. And he is forbearing. But then he says something interesting here. He says, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. What an awesome God that we have. That he is so kind that his kindness draws us to that place where we will turn away from that which makes our lives miserable to those things that will not only make our lives better, but will bring honor and glory to him. <coughs> his kindness is meant to bring us to repentance. Now, we have this idea of the thundering God sitting up in heaven with a bolt of lightning, just impatient and not being able to wait to zap us. You know that feeling you get when you pull the cookies out of the oven and they're burned? Zap! Because you just thought a bad thought. That feeling you get when your favorite team gets down to the last two minutes and gives up the lead and loses the game, zap! You had that thought. Probably you said it out loud, too. You know that feeling when you're driving down the road and somebody pulls out in front of you, crosses two lanes of traffic to get in front of you and do 20 miles under the speed limit? Zap! He blew me up. But that's not what Scripture says, is it? See, it's his kindness. The fact that he is a kind and loving God that put Jesus on the cross so that there could be a way that we could have right relationship with him so that we wouldn't have to suffer the zap. <laughs> the wrath. Wrath is not what God chooses. It's not what he wants. That's not his desire. It is the logical outcome 
of sinning against a God who is absolutely righteous. He is just. He gives you what your sin deserves. And the only way to not get what, his, what your sin deserves is to be covered by the blood of His Son who has paid the price for those sins. See, it's that simple. You can go before God with Jesus as your intercessor saying, No, Dad, I died for this one. Or you can represent yourself. Oh, God, didn't you see he was doing 20 miles under the speed limit? And that perfect justice is what you receive. So I want what you, what, what, what my desire for you to take away from today is. Okay? First we understand God is love. Love is defined by who God is. Okay? Love doesn't describe God. God is love. Okay? So I want you to take that understanding. I want you to look at what that means in light of 1 Corinthians 13. So that you can understand the nature of the God that we serve. And you can understand that the cross was the greatest act of kindness ever done in the history of creation. Nothing will supersede it. Nothing. Father, we bless you this morning. And I ask, Lord God, that you would settle into our hearts and our minds the truth of who you are. That, Father, you would not allow us to be distracted or put off or lied to and deceived. But, Father, we would see truth. Father, your spirit is the revealer of truth and you have sealed us with your spirit. We are asking this morning, God, that you would seal in our hearts and our minds this truth. And we bless you this morning, Father, and we thank you, we honor you, and we lift your name up. In Jesus' name, amen.